Hello everybody, it's Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries and we're reading the Torah portion for this coming Shabbat. It's going to be the 31st reading in this year's cycle. It's Leviticus 21.1 to 24.23. And we're continuing to see the instructions for the people and the priest that our Creator told Moses to tell the people. Now some people tell me that we don't have to follow the law of Moses and Moses never made the law or the guidelines or the instructions. They came directly from our Creator's mouth. Moses just being the messenger, giving the message to the people, so they needed to follow this. And we saw in previous chapters of the, the consequences of what happens when you disobey or you don't carry out the instructions exactly how our Creator told you. And there are many different consequences, but there are primarily three that we see very often. One is a disease or a plague will happen for disobedience or ignoring. Another one would be being cut off from the community. And then finally, a very common one was death. These are all three common uh, consequences of disobeying the guidelines and instructions. So in this chapter, the first chapter of this week's reading, in Leviticus 21.1 to 24.23, we're going to be seeing the priest and what they were told to be doing. They were told to be set apart from the set apart. So all the people here in the community of Israel were set apart. They came out of Egypt and, and, and our wonderful Creator said they are set apart. And now we're going to see the set apart from the set apart. The, the priest had even something higher to do and, and, and even more important. And it says in the scriptures, uh, much is required to those who are given. And this knowledge that is given to the high priest and the knowledge that are given to the set apart people, well, they required much more to be doing. Well, it's the same thing for us today. As believers, we've been given uh, knowledge and we have much more responsibility than for those people that haven't been exposed to this knowledge. So we have that responsibility to carry that out. When you accept Yeshua as Messiah, you are also saying, I'm going to keep the guidelines and instructions He wanted me to keep. And that's what we find here in the Torah portions, which is the foundation of all scripture. So looking at this foundation, the top, the people at the top have to be setting the example for the people at the bottom. And that's when we come to the high priest and Aaron's sons, the Levites, and we see what is required of them here. So we're going to start reading in chapter 21 of Leviticus. And 21.1 says, And our Creator said to Moses, Now most of the, of the chapters in Leviticus will start off with our Creator giving these instructions to the people via Moses. Moses being the prophet getting the message from our Creator and giving it to the people. Our Creator said to Moses, Speak to the priest. So we need to keep in mind here, he's speaking to the priest. Now, there's no uh, temple today, there's no sacrifice, and there's no Levites that we know who they are. It's a different time we live in today. And we are, we could say Yeshua is our priest, and we go through him to get through the Father, but we're also considered priests to a degree, if you look at it from a different viewpoint, but it's different than the priest back then. So we no longer have the, the tabernacle, and some of these things we can't do today. But as the representatives of our wonderful Creator, when we're believers in Yeshua Messiah, we have instructions that we're responsible for. So as we're reading this, remember in verse 1 here it says, Speak to the priest. So this was for the priest that were setting up the tabernacle and ones in charge of it. And it specifically says, Aaron's sons, and you shall say to them, None shall be defiled for the dead among his people. Now, this was something that was very common uh, amongst, uh, as we're going to see, the pagan and all the heathen nations back then, which we're going to see now about the dead, because there's a lot of instructions about what defiled for the dead actually means. And one of those things is having sorrow for the dead. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 2, uh, But for his relative who is near to him, for his mother and for his father, and for his son, and for his daughter, and for his brother, and for his sister, the virgin who is near to him, who has not been with a man, for he may be defiled. So he's not to defile himself for anybody who dies that is not close to him, but except for these that he says. And in verse 4, it says something very important here. It says, A leader shall not defile himself among his people to pollute himself. So a leader 
has, again, a higher calling. Verse 5, they shall not make their heads bald, and they shall not shave the corner of their beard, and they shall not make a cutting in their flesh. Now, this was a common practice of the heathen nations at the time to do these things for the dead. So it wasn't just saying don't do these things for the dead because we don't want you to do these things. Now remember also, one of the consequences of premature death at this time was disobedience. So why are you going to honor somebody who was disobedient to our Creator? Do not do these things. It even went on to go tell Aaron um, through via Moses a couple of chops ago, don't mourn your sons that were disobedient to me. Now there's death uh, through natural causes and even then there's not really a sorrow because that means a person lived a long life and I had a great life and it didn't end through a disease or a consequence of sin. But uh, many of the times our life can be cut short through our sin and, our, and the consequences of that and do not mourn for those disobedient people as it says. But here it talks specifically about not shaving your head, cutting your flesh or cutting your beard uh, if, in mourning of the dead here and it says here a great verse uh, or a great note to this verse it says the Canaanites had a practice of sacrificing to goat deities and Satan has long been known as a goat there was even a half man half goat called Pan this is why Yahweh prohibits the cutting of the corner of the beard to have a devil goat like appearance you see today it's quite common people shave their beards and have a goatee well, it was very common back then as well, and the people were doing it with the idea of is they want to uh, be in the image of this goat god, and some people say Satan, and we are not to make ourselves look like them. Well, today it's the same thing. Is this a command that we shouldn't be cutting a beard? We got to look at the principle and the context of that time as what was happening. But a big idea of this is also that we are to be set apart. And most of the people today are obsessed with shaving, whether it's a goatee or a clean shaving beard. So if we're able to have a beard, which, you know, that's determined by our creator. There might be some very few people in this world that just won't grow hair. But for the most of us, if we're able to grow hair, don't destroy it. Let it be the way a wonderful creator wanted us to look and no different. And it says we are especially not to go in and shave and do these things for the dead. This was a common thing that they did back then. And in verse 6 says, They are holy to Elohim, and they shall not pollute the name of their Elohim. For they offer the fire offerings of our Creator, bread of their Elohim, and they are holy. They shall not take a woman who is a harlot or polluted, nor shall they take a woman who is divorced from a husband, for he is holy to Elohim. Now remember, this is the directions and instructions for the priest at this time. So they were discussing... Uh, what the priests were to do. Now, can the people do these things? Well, yes, and I think it would be a great idea for the average person to, to do their best to follow many of these instructions because these instructions were the holy of holies, the set apart of the set apart. Why not strive to be there? It says, You shall sanctify him, for he brings near to the bread of your Elohim. He is holy to you, for I am holy, a creator who is sanctifying you. Now, uh, there might be some things here you might question, well, why can't uh, they marry a divorced woman or take somebody who's a harlot or something like this? What if they're clean now or what if they once lived that life and did something? Well, we have to understand the times we're living in and, and the situations today. Uh, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with somebody marrying a divorced woman. And from a scriptural standpoint, there's many different reasons or consequences or situations why a person might be divorced. And uh, we have to look at those things on an individual basis to determine if they match up with Scripture. But specifically for the priests that were serving in the temple, that's what this was for, or in the tabernacle. And, and, and they were told not to do that. It says, And you shall sanctify him, for he brings near the bread of your Elohim. He is holy to you, for I am holy, uh, Yahweh who is sanctifying you. In verse 9, when a daughter of any priest pollutes herself by going whoring, she is polluting her father. She shall be burned with fire. So one of the ideas of our Creator, or the main idea, is to keep the community pure, to keep it clean, and to destroy every evil root. And that includes the girl here who was going out and uh, being a, a prostitute, and she was told to be burned by fire. And there are other verses where it says if a, uh, an, adult, uh, an adulteress is caught in the act, or somebody curses our Creator, they shall be stoned by the people that heard them. 
you see the, the root, the evil root, cannot continue to grow and destroy the community. It's just like when somebody has a congregation and, and, and somebody's trying to start Lashana Ra in that group, what often happens is nobody says anything and the next thing you know there's a split and they destroy the group. No, this has to be distinguished immediately. And I'm not telling you to burn or destroy or stone that person, but you must kick them out if they're going to have that type of attitude and not let the evil root continue to spread. Verse 10, And the high priest of his brothers on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and whose hand is concentrated to put on the garment on his head, shall not be buried, nor his garments torn. Now there's a note here that says, uh, this means he should not shave his head. So he should not shave his head again. In Egypt, one of the common practices were the pharaohs used to shave their head and then they wore wigs. You talk about an oxymoron. But regardless, uh, one of the requirements or a big requirement of the priest were not to be like the nations around them. Completely. Now all the children of Israel and the community around them was to be set apart and holy. But this is the Holy of Holies and the consequences are a lot more severe for these things. Verse 11, Nor shall he come near any dead person. He shall not defile himself for his father or for his mother. Nor shall he go out from the sanctuary. Nor shall he pollute the sanctuary of his Elohim. For the crown of the anointing oil of Elohim is on him. I am Yahweh. And he shall take a wife of her virginity. He shall not take a widow or one divorced or polluted one. A harlot, but he shall take a virgin of his own people for a wife. Again, uh, it's not saying a person can't marry a divorced person. There's many different reasons a person might get divorced. And according to scripture, it can be a righteous reason. Uh, but in this specific instructions, he's telling the priest they should not do these things. And he shall not pollute his seed among his people. For I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. And a wonderful creator spoke to Moses again saying, and, and, he, and several times we'll see in this chapter, it says he spoke to Moses saying, and uh, it could have been all at one time that he kept reassuring him, this is me saying this, but it could have also been different times, maybe a couple of days apart or even weeks apart. But we know that it was our creator who spoke to Moses saying, and in verse 17, speak to Aaron saying, no man of your seed throughout their generations shall draw near to offer the bread of his Elohim if there is a blemish in him. For no man in whom there is a blemish shall draw near, a blind man or a lame or disfigured or disformed, or a broken-footed man or a broken-handed man, or a humpbacked or crushed one with a spot in his eye, or a scurvy one, or a scabbed, or one with crushed testicles. Well, these things are mentioned for a reason because it was common for all of these deformities and, and issues to be at that time. We think everyone was perfect when we read the scriptures and everyone at that time didn't have issues. Well, no, they had these serious issues and here it was saying no man should come here with these deformities or these handicaps. And the idea was when you gave an offering, you did it with the best. You gave your best and you were your best. And it wasn't saying these people couldn't make an offering, but there were specific instructions of who could make offerings at what times and how they were to do it. And they get into that here. Continuing in verse 21. No man of the seed of Aaron, the priest, in whom there is a blemish, shall come near to offer the fire offerings of a wonderful creator. A blemish in him, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his Elohim. He shall eat the bread of his Elohim, of the most holy things, and of the holy things. But he shall not enter into the veil, and he shall not draw near to the altar, for a blemish in him, and he shall not pollute my sanctuary. For I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. And Moses spoke to Aaron, and to his sons, and all the sons of Israel. So he gave these instructions, and then we're going to go to chapter 22. And chapter 22 starts off, guess what? Our Creator said to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, and they that set themselves apart from the holy things of the son of Israel. So now we're not only speaking to Aaron and his sons, you're also speaking to they that set themselves apart to the holy things of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name in what they devote to me. I am Yahweh. Say to them, out of your seed, throughout your generations, any man who draws near to the holy things which the sons of Israel set apart, to Yahweh, 
and his uncleanness bringing upon him, that person shall be cut off from me. I am Yahweh. Verse 4. Any man of the seed of Aaron that is leprous or has an issue, he shall not eat of the holy things until he is clean. And he who touches any uncleanness of a person, or a man whose semen has gone out of him, or a man who touches any swarming thing which is unclean to him, or touches a man who is unclean to him, by any of his uncleanness, the person who touches it shall be unclean until evening, and shall not eat of the holy things, but shall bathe in his flesh with water. And what we're saying here and showing here is, there's a lot of things that's going to make somebody dirty and unclean, but he still has an opportunity to approach our Creator once he becomes clean. So we might have a dirty heart and a dirty sinful nature, but once we become clean, when we accept Yeshua as Messiah, we can now approach our wonderful Creator again. It says in verse 7, And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterwards he shall eat of the holy things, for it is his food. It says in verse 8, He shall not eat a dead body or torn thing, for it is unclean. I am Yahweh. So we look at the instructions for not polluting ourselves with the unclean food, otherwise known as unkosher food. And one of the things was uh, something that died by itself or is torn uh, to death. That, that These are the things that should never be eaten according to our Creator. Verse 9, And he shall keep my charge and shall bear no sin for it. They that may not die for it when they pollute it. I am Yahweh who is sanctifying you. Well, it says they should bear no sin, so they may not die. Well, what is sin? Transgression of the Torah. So they shall keep the guidelines and instructions so they don't die. It's very clear, folks. Now, we're all going to die, but this is talking about a premature death based on our actions. Because the scriptures clearly shows that the length of our life and the quantity and quality of our life can be determined by our actions. And those that live in sin, continue to break the guidelines and trucks of our Creator, will suffer, as it says over and over in the scriptures. Uh, the wicked, their life will be cut short. Verse 10, And no stranger shall eat of the holy things. So no unholy person shall eat of the holy things, or the set-apart things. A tenant of a priest, or a hired servant, these shall not eat of the holy thing. And if a person buys a person the purchase of his silver, he shall not eat of it. Also, one born in his house shall eat of his bread. And the priest's daughter, when she belongs to an alien man, she may, she may not eat the heave offering of the holy things. But the priest's daughter, when she is a widow or divorced, and has no seed, and has turned back to her father's house, as in her youth, she shall eat the father's bread, but no stranger shall eat of it. Verse 14, And if a man shall eat of a holy thing through ignorance, then he shall add a fifth part of it, and shall give it to the priest along with the holy thing. And they shall not pollute the holy things of the sons of Israel, that which they lift up to our wonderful Creator. Again, it's about keeping the community pure and clean, and destroying the things that are destroying the root that is coming in to destroy the community. Verse 16, And so cause them to bear the iniquity of the guilt offering in their eating their holy things, for I am Yahweh who sanctifies them. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying again in verse 17, Again, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, Now this is going to all of them, not just the priest. Any man of the house of Israel or of the aliens in Israel, the non uh, Israel people, the non-sons of Jacob that are living with them, so they were all responsible for Torah, keeping the guidelines and instructions, who brings near his offering of all his vows, or of all his freewill offerings, which they bring near to Yahweh for a burnt offering, at your own will, your own will, so they willingly brought their offerings, at your own will, a male without blemish of the ox, of the sheep, of the goat may be offered. You shall not offer that which has been blemished, for it shall not be acceptable for you. So every person living in this community was to bring the best of the best. There was no such thing as something that was just okay. You had to bring the best of the best. Verse 21, And when a man brings near a sacrifice of peace offerings to Yahweh to complete a vow, or for a free will offering of the herd of the flock, it shall be without blemish to be accepted, no blemish shall be in it. Blind or broken or maimed or having a flow or scurvy or scab, 
You shall not bring these near to Yahweh, and you shall not make of them a fire offering on the altar of Yahweh. As to the ox or the sheep deformed or dwarfed, you shall make it a free will offering, but is not acceptable for a vow. And anything bruised or beaten or torn or cut, you shall not bring it near to Yahweh. Even you shall not do it in your land. And you shall not bring near the bread of your Elohim from the hand of the son of a stranger or any of these, for their corruption is in them, and they are blemished. They are not acceptable to you. So, just taking a break here and letting everyone know, in the previous verses and chapters that we've read, we started to see the tabernacle be set up, and what the priests were to do, and they spoke all about offerings, the different type of offerings, and so on. And now here it's going over again uh, why it must be without a blemish, and the consequence of what's going to happen if you bring something that's not your best. Verse 26, A Creator spoke to Moses again, saying, When an ox or a lamb or a goat is born, and when it has been seven days under its mother, and then from the eighth day on onward it is acceptable for an offering. A fire offering to Yahweh. And this is very interesting because even though they're talking about an ox or lamb or a goat here, for the first seven days it can't be an offering, but on the eighth day it can. Well, it sp spoke about in the last Torah portion, I believe, or two of them ago, where uh, the, the baby boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day. Well, because of the blood from the pregnancy and from the delivery of the baby, the mother was unclean and the baby would be unclean. But that baby was now made clean after the eighth day. And it's very sim uh, similar or interesting here that they say after eight days the ox, lamb, or goat can, uh, can be given as an offering if it's unblemished. Verse 28, But an ox or a sheep, it and its young, one shall not slaughter in one day. Verse tw and, and that's a very interesting thing because how often do we think about or look at when an animal is being eaten? If, uh, you know, when that animal died, if its, if its parents died or, or the same day. And, uh, I mean, I don't, who's even keeping track of that? But there's a very good chance that your food you're eating, that that did happen, especially in these big slaughterhouses. And uh, that would make the food unkosher. Verse 29, And when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to Yahweh, you shall sacrifice it of your free will. It shall be eaten on that day, and you shall not leave any of it until the morning. I am Yahweh. You shall keep my commands and shall do them. I am Yahweh. That was verse 31. So if we look at Leviticus chapter 22 verse 31, we see the important, the true message. And now we get down to the nitty gritty. It says, you shall keep my commandments. Not just one. It says, you shall keep my commandments and you shall do them. Do is an action word. You shall do them because I am uh, your creator Yahweh. Verse 32, And you shall not profane my holy name, and I shall be counted holy among the sons of Israel. I am Yahweh who is sanctifying you. And there's a great note here. It says, By believing and keeping the commandments, it was glorifying the name of Yahweh, the only true Elohim. And, and it's a great example. It says you may not profane my name. It's not saying not to say the name. It's saying you not to take the name and, and curse the name. If that's going to be the case, then don't say it. But if you're going to say my name, you say it with reverence, and it's totally fine. As a matter of fact, it's very scriptural, because it says it over and over again, how to do that. And it's verse 33. Who is bringing you up out of the land of Egypt to become your Elohim, I am Yahweh. Now we're going to get into chapter 23 of this week's Torah Portia. In verse 1 of chapter 23, it says, and Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, oh, what a surprise. There you go, saying it again. That's a great way to start. We need to understand that. So for those people out there that say the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, no. It was given by a wonderful creator. It wasn't about Moses. It was about a creator gave it and told us to keep it. And Yahweh said to Moses, speak to the sons of Israel and you shall say to them. So now it's to the sons of Israel. It's not even to the priest. It says, speak to the sons of Israel and you shall say to them, the set feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim as holy gatherings, shall be these. These are my appointed feasts. And now we're going to get into the appointed feasts, exactly uh, what they are. And, and remember, they're appointed feasts. And, and this was to the priest as well. The priest knew this. The people had to know it. We have to know it because it says in Scripture over and over again, they are appointed throughout all time, they, all the generations, and they get into this. 
Work is to be done six days, and on the seventh day it shall be a Sabbath of rest, a holy gathering. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yahweh in all your dwellings. So you should do no work. That is the Sabbath day. Verse 4, these are the appointed times of Yahweh, the holy gatherings which you shall proclaim in their appointed seasons. Now, there's a great note here, and I want to bring your attention to this because I was also going to say about this. It says, the fact is that mentions, these are my feasts twice, shows that although the Sabbath is also a feast, it is separated from the other feast days, and the other feast days do not have to fall on the Sabbath. Now this is important and this is something that a lot of people miss and as we read through this I'm going to tell you something very interesting. Okay, it says, In the first month, on the 14th of the month, between the evenings is the Passover of our wonderful Creator. So now this is the Hebrew calendar, remember, and with our calendar today we're just so mixed up and uh, it's just so wrong and so off. But we always know when the Passover is going to be based on the calendar. And on the fifth day, of the month is the feast of unleavened bread and you shall eat unleavened bread or unleavened things for seven days now we have to understand Passover was that first night but the next seven days after is the, the feast of unleavened bread then verse 7 says on the first day you shall have a holy gathering and you shall do no laborious work so that be a Sabbath and you shall bring near fire offering to a wonderful creator seven days and on the seventh day it shall be a holy gathering you shall do no labor's work. And Yahweh said to Moses in verse 9, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving you, and have reaped its harvest, and have brought in the Omar and the beginning of your harvest to the priest, then he shall wave the Omar before Yahweh for your acceptance. And here it says an Omar is a measurement, not a sheaf, and is about two quarts or liters. That's what it says in a note here. And it says, On the morrow of the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Verse 12, And you shall prepare a lamb in a day you wave the Omar, one without a blemish, a son of a year, for a burnt offering to Yahweh. Verse 13, And its food offering shall be two tenths part of flour mixed with oil, a fire offering to Yahweh, a sweet fragrance, and his drink offering, a fourth of a hint of wine. So as we get into the feast here, it's telling the people at that time what exactly needed to be done. We don't have the temple today. We don't have the sacrificial system. There are certain things we can't do to keep the feast exactly, but that doesn't mean we're not supposed to put the effort in and practice and try and celebrate what the feast were about. In verse 14 it says, And you shall not eat bread nor roasted grain nor fresh ears until the same day until you have brought the offering of your Elohim. It is never-ending statute throughout your generations of all your dwellings. A never-ending statute is the Passover, as they're saying. And you shall number to you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring in the Omar of the wave offerings, they shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Now, here we have an issue because a lot of Christians don't understand that there were special Sabbaths other than just Saturday Sabbath. So they think automatically uh, the next day has to be Sunday and you start counting from a Sunday and that would mean that you would have uh, your 49 and then your 50th day as we count the seven, seven Sabbaths and that extra day would always start the day after the Sabbath. But no, the day after the Sabbath could have been a different days of the week depending on when, uh, when it fell. It says, To the next day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number fifty days, and you shall bring near a food offering to our wonderful Creator. You shall bring in bread of your dwellings for the wave offering, two loaves, and they shall be of two-tenths ephod of flour, and they shall be baked with leaven, first fruits to Yahweh. And besides the bread, you shall offer seven lambs without blemish, sons of a year, and one bull, a son of the herd of the two rams. They are a burnt offering to Yahweh, with their food offering and their drink offerings of fire, offering of soothing fragrance to Yahweh. Now this was this, this shivarot, which people call Pentecost, of what the sacrifices were on that day. Verse 19, And you shall offer one of the he goat for a sin offering, and two lambs, sons of a year, for a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruits, a wave offering before Yahweh. Besides the two lambs, they are a holy to Yahweh for the priest. 
and you shall make a proclamation on the same day it is to a holy gathering to you you shall do no laborious work and service it is never ending statute in all your dwellings throughout all your generations again throughout all your generation these set apart times were to take place verse 22 and when you reap the harvest of your land you shall not completely reap a corner of your field nor shall you gather the gleaning of your harvest you shall leave it to them for the poor for the alien i am yahweh your elohim and we saw in a previous chapter a uh, previous torah portion uh, what this was about about not harvesting all the property and sharing and, and and letting the poor and the aliens have some of this as well and this is just a great example of the scriptures of not to store up your treasures up here on earth but to store them in heaven and not to have a a whole bunch of treasure stored in the house or even food stored in the house while people out there in the street are starving and, and this is what Yeshua talked about and Yeshua mentioned. He took the Torah and he gave it to people in practical terms that they could understand it. We see here verse 23. And our Creator spoke to Moses saying, See to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, a holy day Sabbath shall be to you, a memorial acclamation of the resounding of the trumpets, a holy gathering. You shall do no labor's work, and you shall bring a fire offering to our Creator. And Yahweh said to Moses again, saying, Also on the tenth of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement. And this is known as the day of atonement, the day of affliction. It says, They shall be a holy gathering, and you shall humble and weaken your bodies, and shall bring a fire offering to our wonderful Creator. And some people will say that this is a reason or this is why we should be completely fasting on that day. This is a day to, to, uh, to weaken us and afflict us and to, and, and to let us remember. Well, I mean, it says here exactly, uh, you shall humble and weaken your bodies and shall bring a fire offering to our Creator. And you shall do no work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement to atone for you before Yahweh your Elohim. Now, it's a day to humble. As a matter of fact, in verse 29 it says, For any person who is not humbled this same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work in this day shall even cut off that person in the midst of his people. Now, does it say we are to fast from food and have no food in that day? No, it doesn't say that. Now, will fasting humble us and, and afflict us and make us weak? It, it, it should do that. And so, this is why the rabbis have decided, well, that's a day we should fast and not consume food. It says here in verse 31, you shall do no work. It is never an ending statu It is a never-ending statute uh, throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall humble your souls in the ninth of the month and at evening. From evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. This was known as the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So we'll go to verse 33. It says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses again, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall be a feast of booths, seven days to Yahweh. And this is the Feast of Sukkot. And all these feasts line up perfectly with the calendar and the events that had happened. And that is the way we can tell and keep track of things today. It says, On the first day you shall be a holy gathering. You shall do no labor's work. It is the Sabbath. 36. On the seventh day you shall bring a fire offering to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall have a holy gathering. And you shall bring a fire offering. It is a solemn assembly. And you shall do no labor's work of service. Again, there were other Sabbaths other than just a Saturday Sabbath. The first and the last day of the, the, the Passover unleavened bread and also of the Sukkot. And these are things a lot of people get confused about or a lot of Christians when they try to talk about the original covenant without knowing it, without studying it. This is why they don't sound too educated because they're saying things that aren't really true. It says here in verse 37, These are the set feasts of Yahweh which you shall proclaim holy gatherings to bring a fire offering to Yahweh, a burnt offering and a food offering, a sacrifice and drink offering, the thing of the day on its own day. Besides the Sabbaths of Yahweh and beside your gifts and besides all your vows and besides your free will offerings which you shall give Yahweh, also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month when you gather the increase of the land, you shall keep the feast of Yahweh seven days on the first day a holy day Sabbath, and on the eighth day, a holy day Sabbath. 
And verse 40, And you shall take to yourselves on the first day of the fruit of the majestic trees, palm branches, and burrows of oak trees and willows of the valley, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim seven days, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh seven days in a year, a never-ending statute throughout your generations. The seventh month you shall keep it. Folks, listen. If you really want to understand Yeshua Messiah, and you really want to understand our Creator, you need to understand the feast. He put them there for a reason. He didn't do away with them as a so-called Christian might say. No, he wants us to keep them throughout all generations because he said that throughout all generations. He didn't tell us to replace them with, with pagan feast days or pagan Hallmark holidays. No, he told us to keep the holy days throughout all our generations. Verse 42, you shall sit in Sukkot for seven days. All who are native in Israel shall sit in Sukkot or booths. It says, so that all your generations shall know that I caused the sons of Israel to leave the Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh Elohim. Verse 44, and Moses declared the appointed feast of Yahweh to the sons of Israel. And he didn't make these feasts up. And in nowhere does he call them Jewish feasts. Their feast for all the people of Israel. Who is Israel? Anyone who proclaims Yeshua as Messiah is responsible for keeping these guidelines and instructions. They're not Jewish feasts. They're, they're biblical feasts for the believers. Now we're going to get to verse, uh, uh, chapter 24 here in this week's Torah portion. And I want to encourage everyone to read the Torah, not on the Sabbath, but prior to that Sabbath, study it, and then read it again on the Sabbath, so you have that much wisdom and knowledge, and you can discuss it with others on the Sabbath. Verse 24, And Yahweh said to Moses, saying, of course it starts off like that again, Command the sons of Israel, and they shall bring to you pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause a light to burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimonial, in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall arrange it from evening until morning, before Yahweh continually, a perpetual statute throughout all your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the pure gold menorah before Yahweh continually. And you shall take flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths shall be in one cake. Now we saw the cakes that were supposed to be by the priest in the tabernacle. We discussed it when we were discussing the tabernacle on a previous Torah portion, and that's what we're talking about here now. Verse 6, And you shall set them in two rows, six on a row on a pure gold table before Yahweh, and you shall put pure frankincense on the row, and it shall be the bread of a memorial, a fire offering to Yahweh. On each Sabbath day he shall arrange it before Yahweh continually for, from the sons of Israel as a never-ending covenant. And it shall belong to Aaron and to his sons, and they shall eat it in the sanctuary, for it is the most holy to him, from the fire offerings of Yahweh, a never-ending statute. Now in verse 10, we, we switch it up a little, explaining um, the name and, and what happens, because we've already saw and read several times it says, They shall not profound my name. Well, here in verse 10 it says, And the son of an Israelite woman, and he was the son of an Egyptian man, went out among the sons of Israel, and the son of the woman of Israel and the man of Israel fought together in a camp. And the son of the woman of Israel blasphemed the name of Yahweh and cursed, and they brought him to Moses, and his mother's name was Shlichtimith, and the daughter of Debari, the tr from the tribe of Dan. Now, this note, I'm going to read the note that here it says, but remember here, this man cursed the name, so they brought him to find out what should happen. And here the note says, again, we see the great importance of the sacred name of Yahweh and how we need to keep the name sanctified. The rabbis, however, take this to the point of not even mentioning the name ever and actually changing scripture when reading it to another name. The third commandment saying not to take Yahweh's name in vain literally means not to change or falsify it or bring it to nothing. We are commanded to praise his name, worship his name, call on his name, and glorify his name. How can you do this if you not even vocalize it? In essence, by not vocalizing the name Yahweh, they intervertly bring it to nothing. And that was the note here and the opinion of uh, the person who translated this. And I can just tell you this. We are told over and again in the scriptures to call on my name. 
and you know the pronunciation there's a question of it how to pronounce it or we don't know how to pronounce it well one thing we do know is we do know his name was not the name of a pagan god named lord and it was not the name of uh, just every other person named god it was the name uh, the one name above all names and one of the closest way we can come to saying it is yad hey viv hey which is yahweh and whatever it is any of the other pronunciations we still know he had a name and we need to address him the best we can. You wouldn't call your friend Steve John, and you wouldn't call John Steve. So why do you call our Creator Lord? Well, Lord is the name of a Baal God, or uh, is the name of a heathen God, and, and we need to understand this. And remember, folks, the enemy is very deceiving. He cannot harm us physically unless our Creator lets him, but he can certainly deceive us, and that's what he's doing to many people. So we are not to bring a name to nothing and not to profound a name. And look at the consequence, verse 12. And they put him under guard that it might be declared to them of the month of Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Bring out the person who cursed my name to the outside of the camp and all those who heard shall lay their hands on his head and all the congregation shall stone him. So all those who heard shall be right there and lay their hands on his head and all the congregation shall stone him. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When any man curses his Elohim, they shall bear his sin, his disobedience. When any man curses the Elohim. It's verse 16. And he who blasphemies the name of Yahweh shall surely die. And all the congregation shall certainly cast stones at him. And as to the alien, so as to the native, when he blasphemies the name, he shall be executed. And a man, when he strikes the life from any man, he shall be executed. Folks, this is serious stuff here that so many people overlook. But when you read the scriptures, speak for itself. Why did he have to go on and on and on saying, anyone who profanes my name? He didn't say anyone who says my name. It says to anyone who says it with a curse or anyone who brings it to nothing. No, we are to say his name with reverence. We are to say his name with joy and with passion. In the right situation at the right time. We never to curse his name. We go on to say verse 17. It gets into a little different topic here, but still the same topic. It says, Any man who strikes the life from any man, he shall surely be executed. Any man who smites an animal to the death shall make it good, body for body. And when a man causes a blemish in his neighbor, as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Break for a break, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. As he has given a blemish to be in a man, so it shall be done to him. And he who smites an animal to death shall repay it. And he who smites a man to death shall be put to death. So the animal, if you killed an animal, you weren't put to death. But if you killed a man, you were put to death. Life for a life. This was from our Creator, and this is what he was told. Now, yes, there's, 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 there's non-vengeance and letting our Creator take vengeance. Uh, but there's a legal system, and the priests were the one who ran the legal system, and they had these instructions that were spoken to the children of Israel, and they didn't seek what they wanted to do in any situation. They sought what our Creator told them to do, and part of that was what the instructions said. And each situation is to have a different consequence. No, it wasn't this man killed this man, so this man automatically had to be put to death. There was a judgment, there was a trial, and then there was an outcome. So if the man innocently killed that person, they were sent to a place of refuge and, and, and so on. It wasn't just clear cut as it sees here. There was a whole process before it would be determined what should happen to these people. And it wasn't based on people's feelings. It was based on what the scriptures had to say, what our Creator told them. Verse 22, One judgment shall be for you, whether an alien or native, for I am Yahweh your Elohim. And that is the fairness of our wonderful Creator. Regardless of where you are and who you came from, you have one judgment for you. You either follow my instructions and statutes, or you don't. That's it. Verse 23, And Moses spoke to the sons of Israel, and they brought the man who cursed Yahweh to the outside of the camp and stoned him with stones. And the sons of Israel did as Yahweh had commanded Moses. First of all, the sons of Israel listened. Second of all, the man was paying the consequences for this evil act. And that was the result. Now, of course, many people that don't understand the scriptures that might open up a scripture and see, oh, this man was stoned, will say, oh, our creator is so evil. No, he is so fair. And he gives us the commandments that are easy to keep. But he says, if you break them, 
you might be cut off from your community. If you break them, you might cause a plague amongst your community. If you break them, you might be put to death. But you don't have to worry about any of those things if you do not break them. Keep them and you don't have to worry about that. So we think about that. I mean, that's like somebody in, let's say, 100 years from now or 500 years from now looking back and saying, oh, this man was put in the electric chair for, for you know, and how, how could these people do such a barbaric thing? Well, there's a reason why that man was put in the electric chair, folks. Uh, but if you don't have all the facts and if you don't have the whole judicial system, you're just going to jump to conclusions. And that was, that's what people do or did and, and do about the scriptures here. All right, that's the Torah push for this week. Next week's Torah portion is going to be the 32nd reading in this year's cycle. And, and we need to keep reading these over and over again each year. We don't just read it once. Each time I read it every year, I always see something different that I've missed the previous year. Something new pops out at me. We need to keep reading it throughout all our generations. Next week's Torah reading is Leviticus 25.1 to 26.2. 25.1 to 26.2. Uh, that's going to be the 30-second reading. If you have any comments or questions about this week's Sabbath reading, please post them below the video. And thank you for checking it out. Until then, everybody, have a great Shabbat this coming Shabbat. And Shalom, Shalom. Come out of the world, oh my people. Seek the truth, avoid the evil. Learn Yahweh's ways. Torah life ministries come out of the world. 